So uh, you might bring the monitors down a little bit on this mic, Andy, if you can. I feel like it's about to squeal. Praise the Lord. Well, it, something happened right there. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Testing, testing, uh-oh, right contact. At least you can hear me. Well, I'm sure he'll, he'll fiddle with it and get it worked out as I, as I talk, amen? Praise the Lord. Well, let's open in a word of prayer. Father, Lord, we just come to you tonight. We thank you for this time together to study your word. We thank you, Lord God, that we can meet together, that we can uh, study your word, Lord God, without fear of persecution. And Lord, we, we pray, Lord God, that you just move tonight. I pray that you speak to us. Lord, you help us to understand your word. Help us to grasp, Lord God, Paul's teaching uh, in Romans. And, and Lord, I pray that you encourage us, that you build us up, Lord God, in our faith. And help us, Lord God, to have a closer uh, walk with you, Lord. And Father, we thank you. We give you praise in your precious name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Andy's been working really hard. Um, for, for weeks now, uh, well, more than that, really, to get this new system set up, and and, uh, and so I'm hoping, I got high hopes, amen, he'll be able to control that thing with a tablet wherever he goes, and so it's pretty neat, amen. Well, it's good to be back, amen, Colin, thank you for, for filling in with Bible study, I heard good reports, and uh, I'm, I'm thankful, amen, yeah. Praise the Lord. God's good, and uh, it, it amazes me how God always fills the gaps when the gaps are needed to be filled. He raises people up and uses people and calls people, and God is good in that way. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Well, Romans chapter 8. I don't know if you... Uh, oh, I lost myself there. For, okay. Okay. I'll just keep talking. If it's an important part, y'all just... Hold your finger up and do this. It means rewind. Amen. And I'll rewind and, and, and start over. Um, Romans chapter 8. I don't know if you read uh, ahead to Romans uh, chapter 8. We finished up a few weeks ago in chapter 7. And uh, boy, chapter 8 is something else. Amen. Chapter 8 is, is, is one of the, the greatest chapters throughout all 66 books of the Bible. I was thinking as I was making these notes, I thought, you know, if, because I was thinking about, you know, uh, what's going on in Israel, and, 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 and I was thinking about persecution around the world and things like that, and I thought, if your Bible was being ripped out of your hand, and you could grab one chapter and rip it out of that Bible and fold it and put it in your pocket to hang on for later, one of those would be Romans chapter 8, if not the one, in my opinion. It's, the, it's one of the greatest chapters. Amen? There's, there's so much here, and it speaks to us about our faith, uh, about our walk with Christ. Um, it, it's su such great encouragement in this chapter. Amen? Um, in the New International Version, the Holy Spirit is mentioned 17 times in Romans chapter 8. That tells you how powerful this chapter is, amen? Seventeen times Paul mentions the Holy Spirit in chapter 8. In chapters 1 through 7, he mentions the Holy Spirit four times. Four times the Holy Spirit's mentioned through chapters 1 through 7, but in chapter 8, he mentions the Holy Spirit 17 times. What do you think the emphasis is in chapter 8? Maybe. Amen. You're, you're keeping up. Proud of you. Amen. The Holy Spirit and the power of the Spirit. Amen. Uh, Paul, in this chapter, will teach us, the reader, about the power of the Spirit to give life. Amen. He will teach us uh, 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 about being led by the Spirit. Amen. How to walk in step with the Spirit. And that if we are in Christ and we walk in step with the Spirit, then we are more than conquerors in Christ. Amen? We are more than conquerors in Christ. Amen? Did y'all hear me say that? That's, hey, that, that's exciting. We're more than conquerors. Amen? We're victorious. Hallelujah. So let's, let's begin here in Romans 
I, I, what I want to do is I want to read all the way through verse 17, and then we're going to go back and we're going to begin to break that down and look at uh, several things. I, I, don't, I don't know for sure if we get through the chapter. Probably not, uh, but we will see. So in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, it says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. <clears throat> and so he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law or requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the spirit those who live according to the flesh have their minds uh, set on what the on what the flesh desires but those who live according uh, in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires the mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him, and if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, who raised Christ from the dead, will also Give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. But it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For, it, uh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live by the spirit, you put to death the misdeeds of the body. You put the deeds, the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received uh, brought about your adoption to sonship, and by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in His sufferings in order that we may also share in His glory. Praise the Lord. Amen? It's good stuff, and it just gets better as we go through the chapter. So in verse, in verse 1 and 2, it said, Therefore, and we all know what that means, right? Go back and see what it's there for. It says, therefore, there is now, everybody say now. now. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Now, there's a major transition, it would seem, from what we have been learning about from Paul to what we see here in chapter 8. As I said, the Holy Spirit was mentioned four times in the first seven chapters and then 17 times in chapter 8. Amen? Previously, Paul spent seven chapters explaining our guilt according to God's law. Amen? Explaining our guilt. Amen? We are all sinners and we have all fallen short of God's glory. He told us in, in, in the previous studies that we've had. Amen? That's what he's told us. That's kind of the way he's been laying it to us, amen, until we get to this point. In chapter 7, Paul talked openly about his struggles, amen, which are similar to your, your struggles and my struggles, amen, in that we try to do good, but we fail, amen. We try to make the right decision, but we make the wrong decision, and Paul describes all of that. We want to do good, but we fail, and then the things we want to do, we don't do, but the things that we do is the things that we don't want to do. Amen? What I called in chapter 7 the 
doo-doos. Amen? He described the constant battle between the flesh and the spirit. And we deal with that constant battle, do we not? That constant battle, that, that drive to sin from our flesh, but also that longing to do right because of the spirit that lives within us. Our flesh desires sin, but our spirit desires righteousness. Amen? In, in Romans chapter 7, I think it's important that we look at this. In Romans 7, look in verse 21. Romans 7, verse 21, it says, So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there. Evil is right there with me, for in my inner being I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Next verse. So then I, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature a slave of the law of sin. Therefore. Don't you love that word sometimes? Therefore there is now. No condemnation to those who are in Christ. Amen? You know the best thing about Romans chapter 7? is 8 follows it. Amen? Jesus rescued us. Amen? When he went to the cross. He rescued us when he went to the cross. He willingly laid down his life in our place and took our punishment. That's what Paul's saying here. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Aren't you thankful tonight? Aren't you thankful that Jesus rescued you in going to the cross? Amen. All we have to do is accept his work in going to the cross for us. That's all we got to do. We just got to believe. Amen. We got to have faith in him believing that what he did was sufficient. Amen. And if we believe that, we believe that that work is sufficient, we put our faith in, in, in Christ, we confess Him as Lord, then He gives us a wonderful gift. The gift that's mentioned 17 times in this chapter. That's the gift of the Holy Spirit, amen? To help us, to comfort us, to convict us, and to empower us, amen? Jesus sets us free from the power that sin had on us. Before salvation, we were in bondage to our sinful nature. Amen? Before we come to know Jesus, before we allowed Him in our life, we were subject to that sin nature. We were slaves to it. It pulled us this way and it pulled us that way. But He sets us free from that, He says. Amen? He set us free from the power that sin had on us and we're made new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, all those who are in Christ are a new creation. We've been made new, amen? He set us free and made us a new person. At that point of submission, we receive salvation and in turn are justified. Amen? Justified, just as if we'd never sinned. Remember that? Paul talked about that, just as if we'd never sinned. Being justified, we are no longer under condemnation because the blood of Jesus has washed us white as snow. Amen? I know this is simple stuff when it comes to our faith, but my goodness, isn't it fun to talk about it? Do you see how, how Paul, in, in, in the previous chapters, he set the stage for chapter 8 in the story of God's grace? Amen? We are not condemned because we're forgiven. Amen? We're forgiven because we've accepted the gift of salvation. It's been there. Ever since Jesus went to the cross, that gift has been there, but so many people refuse to accept the gift. It's like if there was a cure 100% for cancer, but you decided not to accept it. My goodness, how silly would that be? How silly would that be? Well, there is one disease, 
that gets everybody. And there's no cure but one. And it's Jesus. And that's the sin sickness. Amen? Why would we walk away from that? But yet so many people do. Notice in verse 2. It says, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Now, Paul uses the word law to represent law of the Spirit. Law of the Holy Spirit is, is what that's intending there. And the law of sin and death. Now, that, this, this law that he speaks of here is not the law of Moses. It's not the law of Moses. Paul had previously been talking about the law of Moses. He's going to mention it again here in a little bit. But, but this law is not the law of Moses or God's law that we get through Leviticus and, and, and that God give them in the, in the wilderness. It's not that law. It's the law of sin and death. It, it's it's kind of like this. Um, the law of Moses is a law given by God that is a list of guidelines. It's a list of rules. I mean, if we want to look at it in its simplest form, that's what it is. It's a list of guidelines, a list of rules, of regulations to follow, uh, you know, similar to the way our laws of the land uh, work. Amen? We have laws that, 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 that guide us in, in certain things we should and shouldn't do, you know, uh, the, the tax laws. And, and if you go out here and you speed going down the road, there's a law about that, and, and, and we break that law. Amen? So it's, 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 it's laws as in guidelines when we're looking at the law of Moses. But, but the laws that, that, that Paul is speaking of here in verse 2, the law of the Spirit and the law of sin and death, uh, um, these are not laws as in rules or lists or regulations, but rather laws of principle. Laws of principle. Let me try to explain what I'm trying to say here. You know about the law of gravity. The law of gravity. If, if you stand up and jump, you're going to come back down, right? If you step off this platform, if I was to jump off this platform, I'm going to touch the ground, amen? Because the law of gravity is going to pull me there. It's a principle. It, it, it's, it's something that's just there. It's not a list of rules. It just is what it is, amen? The law of gravity. Well, the law of sin and death is much similar. The wages of sin is death if we sin against god then we're going to face punishment amen it's it's just it is what it is amen when talk when paul talks about the law of sin and death it is that if we are disobedient to god when we will face death because of sin amen it's not that if we don't honor the sabbath and and we you know we we uh don't take the lord's name in vain and things like that all of that comes into that but the law of sin and death is that when you sin, you're going to face death. Amen? It's a law of principle. The law of the Spirit and the law of sin and death are similar in, the, in, 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 in that it is what it is. It's a principle, as I said. Uh, a principle of a power, as I said, um, with the, the law, similar to the law of gravity. Gravity. In the NLT... It uses the word power rather than law. And when you look in the New Living Translation, you read that, it says, it says it like this in verses 1 and 2. It says, So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus, and because you belong to Him, the power of the life-giving Spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. So you could replace the word law with power in that text and it would mean the same thing because it is not the law as in the law of Moses, but it is a law of principle. Because of our decision to put faith in Jesus, the power of the Spirit has set us free from the power that sin had upon us. Amen? That principle of what happens when we live in sin. hope that makes sense. Verse 3. It says, For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. 
Now, Paul was not saying here that God's law, the law of Moses, see, he speaks of the law of Moses here, what the law was powerless to do, not the law of sin and death, but the law of Moses, what it was powerless to do. He's not saying that it was weak or useless or ineffective. Matter of fact, the law uh, was and is holy. Amen? Paul explained that. The law of Moses is holy. Amen? It was holy and it is holy. It does its work. Even today, it does its work. Amen? It does the work that it's intended to do. Uh, um, it, it gave a guideline for worship, as I said earlier, uh, and service to God. But most importantly, it reveals our shortcomings. That's what the law does. That's, that's the job that it does. It reveals that we have fallen. It reveals, as Paul said from chapter 1 to chapter 7, it reveals that we cannot keep it. Amen? We fail. We wouldn't know we were sinners if it weren't for the law. Amen? You would drive down the road and not know you're speeding if it wasn't for the law that restricts the, the speed limit. Amen? I don't know why, well, I guess I do know why, but when you go out in the western half of the United States, you can drive fast. I mean, the speed limits are fast. And, and, but around here, you can't do that. And I guess that's because of hills and turns and all of that, because the, it would be really hard to go 80 mile an hour on some of the roads that yeah. around here. But I'll tell you what, when you're driving through the back roads in western half of the United States, it's 80 mile an hour and potholes this big. I mean, you've got to be careful. And then every now and then there's a cow in the road. So you, you just got to be careful. But it's 80 miles an hour. I mean, it's just, just go. Amen? But we wouldn't know that there was a speed limit if there wasn't a law that limits speed. Amen? What the law was powerless to do is save us. Paul says, he says, for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. What the law was powerless to do was save us, amen? It couldn't do it. It was impossible. The law's like a mirror. It reveals who we are and what we've done. It can't fix it, amen? It can show that you've got something on your face, but it cannot take care of that. And that something on our face represents sin, and the, and the law cannot fix that. But Jesus can. Amen? But Jesus can. Our flesh is in rebellion to the law of God. And therefore, we can't keep it. Amen? We can't keep it. We fall short every time. And for that reason, as Paul explains here, God sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering, to pay the price. It says, it says, it continues there in verse 3 and 4. It says, and so he condemned sin in the flesh. Jesus condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the spirit. Now, there's... there's belief that this little section of scripture here who do not live according to the flesh but according to the spirit was added much later that it wasn't in many of the the more uh, ancient manuscripts um, and, and it may be the case but it, it doesn't change anything amen because Paul mentions that same phrase here in just a little bit but it doesn't really change anything even if it wasn't there originally uh, because it, I think it 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 uh, I think it just highlights it a little more uh, if, if, we, if we read it within context. Amen? And so he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. So how is the righteous requirements of the law fulfilled in us or met in us? How, how, how is that? Well, if you're saved... Amen. If you're saved, if you've placed your faith and your trust in Jesus, if he resides in you, he's placed his spirit in you, and therefore, if you live according to the spirit that is in you, the righteous requirements of the law is fulfilled in you. Amen. Notice what Paul doesn't say. 
The righteous requirements of the law are fulfilled by you. Amen? That's impossible. Nobody's ever kept the law. Remember the one guy that come to Jesus and, and, and he wanted to know what he could do to obtain, uh, to gain eternal life. And, and Jesus said, well, have you kept the law? He said, well, yeah. And Jesus asked him, well, you've done this, done that. And he said, okay, well, you've done good. He said, now go sell everything you have and come and follow me. He couldn't do that. He couldn't do that. So could he follow the law? No. He never followed the whole law. And that's what Jesus was pointing out. Nobody has except for Jesus. Amen? Nobody has. So this brings us back to Paul's first point. In that case, we are not condemned. Amen? In that case, we are not condemned. Let me show you how I put that together. And so he condemned in the flesh, he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit, continuing. Um, we are no longer, we are, let me go back to, here, let me use my Bible instead of my notes. Because he says, therefore, there is now no condemnation of those who are in Christ. Why is there no condemnation of those who are in Christ? Because the righteous requirements of the law have been fulfilled in us, not by us. Amen? Because He is in us. Amen? Because He is in us, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Amen? So many Christians live in condemnation. This is, this is just the plain, simple truth. So many Bible-believing Christians live in condemnation. You might say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, it's, it's, just, it's just quite simple. Amen? Because the, 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 the sad thing is, it, it's self-condemnation. Because, because if Jesus' work on the cross was sufficient, and it was, then you're no longer under condemnation, but under grace. Amen? And it's hard for many people to grasp that. It's hard for people to understand that I'm no longer condemned. People feel like every little thing they do, they become under condemnation. Well, many times we're bringing ourself under condemnation. Amen? Many times the legalistic person walks in fear of condemnation. What do I mean by legalistic person? Well, most of you probably know what I mean, but there are people that... Um, they will pull certain passages out and they will um, basically try to earn their salvation. It's more like they, instead of searching the Bible and seeing the love of God, we're looking for specific things to get a list of things I can't do, I can't do, I can't do. Amen? All I see when I look at the Word of God is what I can do. Does that make sense? We, we look so much for the things that, that we... The key word in all this is work because so many people want to earn their salvation. They, they, they have this, this fear of condemnation so they feel like they have to do things to appease God. Amen? I hope I'm making sense in this. Uh, Here's the thing. There's a major difference between holiness and legalism. Amen? You got holiness on one hand and legalism on the other. And many people look at holiness because we think of the holiness movement and we think, well, that's legalism. Well, I'm talking about two completely different things here. Amen? I'm talking about holiness, living holy before God, which means set apart, and legalism. I have to be very careful because there is a fine line there, but there's a difference. Many times people uh, such as new Christian, unlearned Christians, and non-believers want to know what point, at what point sin becomes sin. How many in here has ever been asked the question, well, is such and such sin? Is it a sin to smoke dope? I'm serious. 
Oh, Mia Kate answered me. Hopefully she said yes. Uh, but <laughs> you, know, you, you know what I'm saying? People will ask the silliest questions. Is it a sin to smoke dope? Is it a sin to, to smoke cigarettes? Is it a sin to uh, 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 watch a rated R movie? And people want to know that fine line between what's sin and what is not sin. You know why people want to know the fine line of where sin is and where sin's not? So they can get right there on the edge and try to live on the edge. We was hunting out west last week and and, and, and we was hunting for pronghorn, antelope. Some of you may know what I'm talking about. And out there, there's, there's not very many fences. So you got public land and private land. Well, most people don't have permission to hunt on the private land. So most everybody that hunt, they hunt on public land. Well, these antelope know where those lines are, <laughs> even though there's no fences. But this is what they do. They like to stay close to the line. And every now and then they slip up and they cross the line and it don't work out too well for them. Amen? And that's what happens in life. We want to know that line. Where is that dividing line? Is this sin or is that sin? Here's the thing. If you've got to ask the question, the Holy Spirit's probably already working on you. Amen? I heard a pastor say this. He said, he said when people come to him with silly questions like that, he says this. He says, are you saved? Well, yeah. Are you, do you, do you, so that means you have the Holy Spirit living in you. Well, yeah. Well, what's he telling you? Why are you asking me? What's he telling you? Amen? I mean, that's how we should live our life. I don't want to be close to the fence. Amen? I don't want to even be within sin distance. I want to live holy before God. I want to live holy before God. What does that mean? That means to be set apart. Amen? God does not want us to live on the fence. He, he, he doesn't want us to do that. If we live according to the law, we're going to live on the fence all the time. Because we're going to be trying to earn salvation. We're going to be trying to do and do and do because we want to try to appease God I want to do the things that I do just simply because I love God amen just simply because I love him not for any other reason I, I, I don't want to try to keep God from correcting me and 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 getting on me for something I, I, I want to just live for him because I love him amen I mean, that's just the plain, simple way to look at it. If, 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 a, if a person is born again and they don't use foul language, hopefully it's not because they're so fearful that the Bible does say something about foul language. Hopefully it's because they don't want to use that language because they just love God. Amen? If someone stays away from the bars and, and drinking and things like that, hopefully it's not because they're trying to find whether the Bible actually does say you can or cannot drink. Hopefully that's not the reason. Hopefully the reason is just because they simply love God and I don't need that stuff. Amen? I mean, it's simple. It's very simple. But the reason why Christians walk in condemnation is because they want to find that fine line. Amen? If you, th if you have to ask, is, is, is this sinful or is that sinful? Well, then you already got your answer. Amen? It's kind of like meat in the refrigerator. told somebody this this past week. If you pull out a pack of bologna and it's got a little smell to it, well, would you go ahead and eat it to see if it's okay? No, you're going to throw it out. Amen? There's probably some people during COVID that probably ate it, but, but they, uh, you know, they couldn't smell it. And then they got a bellyache. But, but if you can smell a little bit of stench, Get rid of that stuff, amen? It's the same way in life, amen? When in doubt, throw it out. Did you say it needs more mayonnaise? <laughs> to live holy before God is to walk in step with the Spirit, amen? 
to walk in step with the Spirit. Jesus sent His Spirit to guide us, to comfort us, to convict us, and to empower us. Amen? The Holy Spirit lets us know when we're heading the wrong direction. Thank God. I'm so thankful for the conviction of the Holy Spirit. You know the conviction of the Holy Spirit is not to condemn me. It's to redirect me. Amen? It's not to beat me up. It's to help me make a right decision. Amen? If you attempt to keep the entire law of Moses, you're going to fail. Because it's impossible. The righteous requirement of the law is fulfilled in us. Is fulfilled uh, in us, not by us, as I said earlier. Because of the Holy Spirit within us. The Holy Spirit helps us in that He helps us to love. I want to show you something. There's a movement within, um, within the church, within um, I'm trying to think of the right words to use here. There's this movement uh, to go back to the law. It's like I think it's called the Jewish Roots Movement or something like that. And, and, and this is the thing. You've got to be careful. Amen? You've got to be careful with the things you hear and the things you read and the things you listen to. You need to be grounded in the Word of God. You need to check everything by the Word of God. Amen? In Galatians chapter 5, verse 14... It says this, it says, For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. I don't know where the whole thought of the Jewish roots movement come from, but it just popped in my mind and I felt like I needed to mention that. But We cannot keep the law. Amen? But notice what Paul says in Galatians 5.14. He says, For the entire law is fulfilled in this, in, in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, as we know, Jesus also said this, this that, 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 that the law is hinged on this, on this commandment of love. In Matthew 22, 37 through 40, Jesus said, when he replied to um, the religious leaders, he said, he said, love the Lord your God, when they asked him what the two greatest commandments were, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 40. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Now some would say, well, I guess we can keep the law as long as we love God and love people. Well, okay. But I'm going to tell you right now, without the spirit of the living God living with inside of you, you're not going to love God and love people. It's not going to happen. Amen? If that was the case, if it was so simple to follow the law... Jesus wouldn't have had to go to the cross. So when people think we can live according to the law and we're going to be fine as long as we honor the Sabbath and, and do all of the things that, that some of the movements uh, want you to do, they're very badly mistaken. Amen? Very badly mistaken. You can't do enough. And Paul spent seven chapters explaining that to us. And now he's telling us that that righteous requirement of the law has been fulfilled in us. He did it. Amen. He did it. In the next verses, uh, Paul is going to thoroughly explain what uh, submission to the Spirit looks like. And my goodness, we've only made it to verse 5. Uh, those who live according to the flesh, verse 5, Romans chapter 8. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live accord in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, and the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God, nor can it do so. Excuse me. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. Have you ever heard someone say that, that somebody is set in their ways? I'm not going to ask, but there might be a few in here that are set in their ways. Uh, 
Um, sometimes I am set in my ways. Easy, Abigail. Um, what? So wh what does it mean if somebody is set in their ways? It simply means that you can't change their mind. Amen? It, it, it's... <laughs> It's their way, amen? And, uh, and I can tell that some of us in here are like that. <laughs> it means that we have a certain way of doing things, and it doesn't matter what somebody says or does, it's not going to change it. That's the way it's going to be, amen? That's not always bad. But if that mindset is a bad mindset, it's bad, amen? But, you know, we can be set in our ways of getting up and reading our Bible and praying and, and doing things like that, and that's good. Amen? But here's the thing. Flesh is determined to sin. And the word Paul uses here, he says, according to the flesh. According to, it literally means in a manner of, in a manner of corresponding or conforming to. Or conforming to. That's becoming like. Amen? Amen? He said, if you, if you, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. I wonder, what is your mind set on? Is your mind set on the things of the Spirit? Is it led by the Spirit? Or is it set on the fleshly desires? I think that's a question we should ask ourselves every day. Amen? There's been many times in my life, as, as I'm sure has been in yours, that I've had my mind set on purchasing something, that I've had my mind set on, on doing something, and I was determined and no one could steer me one direction or the other. I'm doing it. Don't cross your arms and look at me like that. You, you're, you're worse than I am. Anyway... <laughs> where was I at I got distracted when I looked at my wife <laughs> oh boy I have completely lost where I was yeah yeah I'm still trying to figure out where I was of course uh, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on the flesh, and those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on the Spirit. The key is this. Whatever or whichever you conform to, then your mind is set on it. Do you conform to the flesh, or do you conform to the Spirit and the leading of the Spirit? As I said a while ago, if somebody asks, you know, is it a sin to smoke dope? And you look at them and you say, well, are you saved? Yeah. Well, then you have the Holy Spirit living in you. So what is he telling you? So wha what are you conformed to? Are you conformed to the flesh so you want to live right on the line? Or are you conformed to the Spirit where you want to stay away from that line? I don't want nothing to do with it. Does that make sense? Paul then describes, again, this condition. The NIV uses the word governed. The King James uses the word carnally or spiritually. Let me read it to you again in verse uh, uh, 6. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile towards God. The mind governed by the flesh are to be carnally minded, as the King James puts it. Both indicate submission. Amen? To be governed, or when, when, when the King James uses carnally minded, which means worldly minded, it means to it be in submission to. But submission to what? Simple. When the King James uses the word carnal, it means worldly. Amen? To be submissive to worldly ways, worldly ideas. Amen? Worldly thoughts, worldly desires 
a worldly system, a system of our own sin nature. Amen? A nature that we're born with. The mind governed by the Spirit, or in the King James, to be spiritually minded, also means to be in submission. Amen? Submission to the Spirit. To submit to the leading of the Spirit. To be governed by the Spirit. Amen? Paul said that those who are governed by the flesh are carnally minded or hostile towards God. Which means opposed to God. To be hostile towards God. It means to be opposed to God. In James chapter 4 verse 4 it says this. It says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Paul went on to say that those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. This could, uh, this could be translated as under the control of the flesh. Amen? Amen? Those governed by the flesh, those who are in the realm of the flesh, cannot please God. Those who are controlled by the flesh, those who are submissive to the flesh, cannot please God. You've heard somebody say, I'm sure, or you've said it yourself, that at some point in the day or in the week or in your life, well, I got into my flesh a little bit. You know, that was my flesh talking. We've all been there. Amen? We've all been there. That's simply saying that at that moment, I wasn't very pleasing to God. Amen? I wasn't pleasing to God because I was in the flesh, because the flesh cannot please God. Amen? And if we are in the flesh... If we live according to the flesh, governed by the flesh, then we're prone to sin. And our fleshly sin nature is at odds with God. That's simply what Paul's telling us. But if we are governed by the Spirit, it's much different. Amen? If we're governed by the Spirit, we stay away from that fence. We quit looking for the boundary lines. Amen? If we're governed by the Spirit. Verse 9. It says, you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh. See, here's good news. Paul's making that comparison, and then he tells you right there. He says, after saying all that, he says, you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of the Spirit who lives in you. Paul's saying, li, li, he's saying simply this. He's saying, listen here, if the Spirit of God lives in you, then you're not in the realm of or controlled by the flesh. Therefore, you're not an enemy of God. Therefore, you're not hostile towards God. Amen? Paul's given a word of encouragement here. Because hopefully the reader is, is, has already given their life to Christ and he's saying, listen, you're, you're not, that's not you. But I'm telling you, if you live in the flesh, that's what, it's, that's what, it, that's what it means. That's what it'll be like. But, but you're not that. You're in the realm of the Spirit. Amen? You're in the realm of the Spirit. If you are in Christ, you are in the realm of the Spirit. And you no, are not at odds with God. It says, if, Paul said, if someone does not have the Spirit, then they do not belong to Jesus. Now, this is where we, just, we have to tread lightly, and we have to make sure that we are uh, looking at Scripture in context, because this is where things get a little uh, um, misinterpreted sometimes. Amen? Some people will take this, and they will um, begin to uh, uh, be very judgmental. And, and, and I'm, hopefully I can explain this a little bit. 
bad theology sprouts up sometimes because of that verse. In the assemblies of God, we believe that speaking in tongues is the initial physical evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Amen? So if someone didn't know any better, and they were unlearned, and I've, I've heard of this happening before in the past, but if someone was uh, unlearned and, 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 and um, they would be inclined to think that if you had never spoken in tongues then you do not have the Spirit, therefore you do not belong to Christ. And that's just simply not true. Amen? That is simply not true. That, that's where they take a verse like this and they begin to think about it with their carnal mind without studying the scriptures and looking at the context of scripture and they get bad theology. I've heard of people saying that even in this church years ago. Well, if you haven't ever spoken in tongues, then you're not saved. Because the Bible says, then you are not of Christ. You, you, you do not belong to Christ because you don't have the Spirit. Well, listen, I don't have to see my bow tie, tie my bow tie to be saved. Amen? I want the empowering of the Holy Spirit. I want the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but that is not what saves me. Amen? Faith and believing in Jesus Christ is what saves us. And at that moment, at that moment, He seals us with the Holy Spirit. Amen? He seals us with the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 1, it says this. It says, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in, you were marked in Him with a seal. Did you catch that? He says, when you believed, you were marked in Him with a seal. The promised Holy Spirit. That is our seal. Amen? He goes on in verse 14. He says, who is a deposit? The Holy Spirit is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of His glory. So at the moment of salvation, the moment you make that confession of faith, you have a seal put upon you, and uh, put in you actually, and that is the Holy Spirit. Amen? A deposit. You could look at it as a down payment. A good faith deposit. Because he's going to come through. Amen? He already has, but one day, glory to God, we're going to be with him in glory. The Holy Spirit is your seal. So we have to be careful with texts like that because some people would think that if you're not speaking in tongues, then you're not saved, but that's, that's not the truth. Amen? The baptism of the Holy Spirit uh, is many times a separate event. Amen? A separate event. When God just floods you with the Holy Spirit. You know, sometimes it's really hard to d explain, to describe the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And, and that's why it gets so confusing. But the fact of the matter is, that the, probably the best way to look at it is, a, at the moment of salvation, you get the deposit. Amen? But when you, when you get the baptism of the Holy Ghost, He fills your bank account. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that, that's probably the best way to explain it so people can understand. It's like you got the Holy Spirit, but when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, it's like it's bubbling out of you. Amen? So you can't help but see my bow tie, tie my bow tie. It just comes out, you know? That's probably the best, easiest under, way to understand the baptism of the Holy Spirit, in my opinion. The point is this. If you're saved, then you have the Spirit living in you, and therefore you belong to Christ. Amen? You belong to Him. He has a receipt. He paid for you. Amen? Verse 10. It says, But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. Even though we're su we are subject to death because we are stuck in this shell. Amen? We're stuck in this body of flesh. He gives us life. 
Even though we're stuck in it, He gives us life. The Holy Spirit helps us not only to live, but to live for Christ. Amen? Which would be an impossible task without Him. We wouldn't be able to do it. Also, because of Him who lives in us, we have the hope of a resurrection. Amen? We have a hope of a resurrection. Even though we will face death in our mortal bodies, we will live again. Amen? That's what Paul's explaining here. Uh, our spirit is not mortal. Our spirit will continue after we die. Amen? But because of Jesus and His Spirit in us, even though our bodies will one day, uh, uh, even our bodies will one day be transformed. As He transforms us here and now spiritually, He will one day transform our bodies when we are brought out of the grave. Amen? In 1 Corinthians 15, if y'all got your Bibles, you can turn there. I'm going to read a few verses. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. I love to hear the rustle of pages in the Bible. I do. First Corinthians 15, verse 50. It says, I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. Sounds like Jonathan Kahn. I'm telling you a mystery. Uh, we will, we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the, trump, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must, must clothe itself with imperishable, and the mortal with immortality." When the perishable has been clothed with imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that, that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your, your, where, oh death, is your sting? The sting of uh, death is sin and the power uh, 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 of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor uh, in the Lord is not in vain. The, mor the, 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 um, the mortal will put on immortality. The perishable will become imperishable. So our bodies will also be changed. Amen? Isn't that amazing? Verse 12. We're almost done. I got five minutes. Maybe. I think that clock's wrong. But I'm going to take five minutes. If that's okay. No, I got a minute. I'm going to take five. Amen? Verse 12. It says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if the spirit, but but if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will leave. What's our obligation? Our obligation is to serve Jesus. Amen. Our obligation is to live for Him. Amen. Our obligation is to walk in step with the Spirit. Amen. To enjoy the gift that He gave us, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of salvation and the gift of the Holy Spirit. To put to death the worldly things of the flesh, the desires that we once had, and walk in submission to the Holy Spirit. Amen? Submission to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Last few verses. Verse 14. It says, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are, if we are children, then we are heirs and 
heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Now, I'll touch on this next week, but I love that part of the text about spirit of sonship that we cry, Abba, Father. Amen? The spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. You know what Abba, Father means? It means Daddy. If you could hear the voices in Israel as all the chaos was going on and hear children crying out to their dads, they would be saying Abba or Abba is the better pronunciation. Abba. Can you imagine? I watched this movie one time and this guy, he, he, it was a, it was a, a Christian-based movie and he was... Uh, he would talk to God a lot, and he'd call him Daddy. Daddy. You know, we can have that intimate relationship with God. That's what Paul's explaining to us here in chapter 8. We can walk in step with the Spirit. We can live according to the Spirit. We can be governed by the Spirit. And if we are, then we're children of God. And we can call him Abba. Daddy. I don't know about you, but that just... Mm. Mm. Do you see why Romans chapter 8 is so significant? Why it's so important? Why it's so encouraging? You know, we, we haven't even finished the chapter... And I hope you can see why I said that if, if, if there was one chapter that I would rip out of my Bible if it's being ripped out of my hand so I could hang on to it. So that every time I looked at it, I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged to stay away from that fence. I'm encouraged not to find that, that fine line, but to stay over here because I want to walk in step with the Spirit. It would be Romans chapter 8. Amen? Because I'd want to be encouraged. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, anybody got any prayer requests? I'm going to have to mark where I left off here. Yes. Did you talk to her today? How's she doing? Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Okay, anybody else? Okay. Anything specific? Huh? Oh, okay. Yeah. Anybody else? Oh, really? Ooh. In Kentucky or California or? Oh, wow. Mm. Anybody else? Yeah, Angel just mentioned Sandy. Andy. Oh, really? Okay. Pray for salvation there. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah. Sawyer. Saul. I'll never call him Sawyer. Yes, sir. And Saturday. Amen. Amen. Do you have your hand up, Rob? Mm -hmm. Amen. What's her name? Jean. Amen. 
Oh, do you? Amen. How, how's your How's your soreness? Amen. Okay, good, good. Amen. Y'all may not know it, but Rob, uh, he had a bad accident uh, last week. He flipped his flipped his SUV on the interstate, and so praise the Lord. I'd probably still be in the hospital. All right, let's pray. I understand that. Dad had a vehicle catch on fire one time on the farm we hunted on, and uh, when it went up in blaze, we happened to remember ammo and firearms, and we had to hide because it was going everywhere. <laughs> Thankfully, it was way back in a field somewhere, and we was out of danger. Well, let's pray. Father, Lord, we just lift these needs to you, and we thank you, Lord, for bringing us together tonight, and and uh, for, uh, Lord, for hearing our prayers. We thank you, God, for your grace, for your mercy, for your love. And, Lord, I, I, I pray as we come together in agreement tonight, Lord God, that you, that you not only hear, but you answer. I pray that you touch these people that we're about to bring to you, Lord God, and, and, and that you, you, just, you just do a work in these situations, Lord God. Lord, we pray for Sherry Pearl. Uh, my Aunt Sherry, Lord God, as, as she's dealing with a, a loss of a, a very beloved pet, and it's, it's, I'm sure with her being alone, it's, it really gets her down. And, and Lord, I pray that you comfort her. I, I pray that you be with her in, in this lonely time, Lord God, and, and, and help her through. Um, help her to experience that peace that passes all understanding, Lord. And Father, we pray for uh, Eileen's nephew, we pray that he be found, Lord God. Pray that, uh, Lord God, he, he, he gets found uh, safe and, and sound, Lord God, that, that without any complications, Lord, in Jesus' name. But most of all, Lord, we pray for his salvation in Jesus' name. And, and we pray for Charlotte Hemmer's uh, nephew, Lord God, that, that says he doesn't believe in God. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you, you, you just put things in his path, put people in his path that would, that would make him... Uh, come to uh, the, his right mind, Lord God, to understand, Lord God, who you are, Lord God, and that you love him, Lord, that you went to the cross for him, and Lord, that without you there is no hope, and Lord, I pray that you just begin to deal with this young man in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray for little Sawyer. Just reach out your hand to Sawyer. Lord, we pray that you help him to gain weight, Lord God, to, uh, to j just be a little, little fat baby. In Jesus' name, Lord, just, just help him to, uh, to digest his food and, and to uh, just, uh, just begin to gain weight and be healthy, Lord, in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray for Jean, Lord God, that you just touch her. Lord, that you uh, heal her of, of whatever this attack is, Lord God, this allergic attack and, and whatever else this may be. Lord, you know the details. And Lord, I pray that you touch her. We agree together, Lord God, that you'll just do a great work in her. Lord God, heal her, her skin and, and, and all the other ailments that she's dealing with, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Father, we pray for Sandy. We pray, Lord, for healing. Lord, as she's going through her treatments, and we pray, Lord, that you keep her uh, lifted up, encouraged, Lord God, in Jesus' name, that you keep her, uh, um, Lord God, with, with, with hope. Lord, that she'll put her hope in you and trust in you, Lord God, and, 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 Father, I pray, Lord, that you just intervene. Lord, that, that she doesn't even have to finish all of her treatments, that you just take the cancer out, Lord God, and, and you just attack it, Lord God, with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, and, Father, we thank you for it. And, Father, we pray for a good turnout this Saturday, Lord God, for the Fall Festival. And we pray, God, that, that we, uh, Lord, that we have a, a good number of people, we have a good time of fellowship, and, Lord God, that maybe, Lord, we can even reach some in our community, Lord God, by, by loving on our community. And, Lord God, I pray that anybody that comes in, Lord God, that's not normally here, I pray that they feel welcome. I pray, God, that they, they just feel like they, they're home, Lord God. And I pray we see the results of that on Sunday, Lord God, in Wednesday nights, Lord God, that you just begin to bring people in so that they can hear your word, Lord God, and, and just experience you firsthand. Lord, and we thank you, and we give you praise. And Lord, I pray that you be with our people, Lord God, as we leave tonight. Lord, touch each and every one. 
and fill them full of the Holy Spirit, Lord God. Help us to walk uh, in, in boldness. Lord God, help us to be encouraged and, and to be uh, comforted and empowered by the Holy Spirit, Lord God, in your precious name. And we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.